welcome to Plymouth 400 Conversations. I'm Michelle Pecoraro, and I'm your host for this series. The 400th commemoration of our nation has inspired a body of creative work, poetry, film, literature, and art. This series will explore several of these projects and how they contribute to the historic, educational, and cultural legacies of the Plymouth 400 commemorations. Today, our guests are three creative writers from three different countries, all of which have some shared history, the history of the Pilgrims. From Leiden, Holland, we have Marianne Van Velzen and Laura Horton from Plymouth, England, and our own Stephen Delbos from Plymouth, Massachusetts. Welcome everyone to Plymouth 400 Conversations. Well, I'm going to start off by asking you a little bit um, about your background. Uh, you are all appointed as the literary ambassadors for your respective cities. In what ways does your professional life include your love of writing and creative thinking? And, um, and also, give us your title uh, as, as the uh, appointed literary person in your city. Uh, let's start with Marianne. Hi. Nice Hi. to be here. And nice to see you all. Um, well, my title is Stadsdichter van Leiden, which means Poet Laureate of Leiden. And um, apart from being a poet, I also have my own company as a coach and as a mediator. And I love to use words in my work. Of course, I ask questions and we talk about stuff, but I also use um, writing exercises um, and creative exercises um, with my clients, because that can really help you to get to a lower level um, to the question behind the question, you could say. Very good. Thank you. And Laura, the answer to the same question, please. Laureate of words. Um, I'm a playwright in my professional life, so words are embedded into my everyday being. Uh, I also work as a publicist. So it's my job to tell other people's stories. Um, and I also write journalistically. So words are a big part of my life. Thank you very much, Laura. And Stephen, how about you? Yes, um, well, I work and have worked as a freelance writer and I've worked in marketing and also teaching, uh, teaching critical writing, academic writing and creative writing as well. So. Um, for me, you know, a love of language and a love of literature are really infused into every aspect of my life and the study of poetry has really um, uh, helped me quite a bit, even in my professional life in working with words. Uh, and I am the first poet laureate of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Very good. We're really um, proud to have you as well. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, one of the, the treats of this interview of this uh, session is that each of you are going to do a reading for us, a sample of your work. So I'm going to first ask uh, Laura uh, to do a reading of some of her work. And then as we go through these interviews, we will uh, ask other people to do readings. Thank you. This is an extract of a piece called Roll Out Plymouth. I wrote this in response to the 80th commemorations of the Blitz because Plymouth was very badly bombed in the war. Um, so it's sort of a response to um, how people have come together in times of crisis. This is an extract from a longer piece. Over 20 minutes, Devonyard Street, Plymouth is battered and burnt like many streets before it in towns and cities across the world. What follows this disquiet is a wild silence, not even a seagull's cry until finally a brick buckles in a nearby doorframe and a tentative mouse jumps and squeaks. Mrs. Thomas takes a deep breath and lifts her head cautiously above the parapet. What she sees is not peeling paisley wallpaper, but the street scattered inside out. Chimney pots in dining rooms, sofas on rubble, toothbrushes in plant pots and mugs in toilets. Jane and Billy lift their dusty faces from under the one leg table their first home together, now a scarred shell, wedding photos broken and charred with missing faces. Lydia and Philip follow their children through the garden of broken gnomes to their half home. One wall entirely blown off, revealing a tableau of human living, a doll's house with an open door. 
Judy and Marge emerge covered in flour, Alan the cat licking plum jam from broken jars, the house of 30 years crammed now with splintered antique mirrors, squashed trinkets and scattered jewellery. Dr Leyland pushes the basement door and emerges as if to an alien street, a landscape of smoke and desolation. As she draws breath, her thesis slips from her hand and flies away. Mr Benjamin snores open to the elements, a shattered pint glass at his hand, his piss pot overturned and whiskey bottle cracked and emptied. An intact piano stands upright in the centre of Mrs Thomas's wrecked dining room. Knives, forks and smashed crockery scatter themselves around the base of the instrument like a modern art installation. Misty leaps onto the keys and straight back off. The discord echoes across the wreckage and each head turns. The children side-eye each other and back to the cat, prickled fur and wide eyes. The rest of the inhabitants of Devon Yard Street slowly emerge. Babes in arms, teenagers, students, first-time buyers, renters, newlyweds, divorcees, singletons, pensioners, workers, those looking for work. Their lives intertwined, not just by closeness and grief, but by their intermingled things. Dr Leyland spots her knickers on the Spencer's living room sofa. Marge's dentures sit atop Mr Benjamin's boiler. Billy's brogues rest on Judy's dresser and Mrs Thomas's saucepan in Lydia's beloved tin bath. Memories, possessions, treasured and nostalgic things collected over decades, mixed up and smashed up in minutes. Without uttering a word and with a nod from Mrs. Thomas, Marge and Billy start pushing the piano into the middle of the road. Lydia carries a chair behind them and Mitzi and Bitsy stalk proudly beside her. They clear an area for some glimpse of normality. Philip pulls the chair back and Mrs. Thomas sits. She clears her throat, fingers poised above the keys. That first deep chord vibrates across the rock and rubble through flesh and bone as they navigate their slippered roots towards the music and to each other. Thank you, Laura. The words are so powerful. You really make us feel like we are there. Um, your description of that is so vivid. Thank you so much. So I have another question now for all three of you, and I will, I'll tell you what order. Um, but I wrote my share of bad poetry uh, as a teenager. I think all of us wrote some sort of poetry or prose as, as teenagers. Um, they were mostly motivated by, you know, romantic uh, interludes, breakups, you know, meetings, all of that. Um, how far back in your lives uh, did you begin writing things down? And when did you realize that you had a talent for creating and writing? And I'm going to start with Laura. I started making plays when I was about seven. And I would get my brother involved and we'd create these performances and I'd charge my parents and their friends 50 pence to come <laughs> and watch. And he would always ruin it by making fart noises. Um, so I started really early. It wasn't until probably school. I remember my English teacher telling me that I had a knack for writing. But it wasn't really until my 30s that I started to take it seriously and actually kind of push my work out there. I think it was a lack of confidence really that stopped me, but it's always been a, a huge part of my life. Thank you. Again, very vivid picture of your uh, childhood. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Stephen, how about you? When did you first learn that you or decide that you uh, had a knack for this? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I was really writing as soon as I could write, essentially. Looking back on elementary school um, at Sacred Heart in Kingston, and I was always writing stories after school, and Sister Mary Kevin would call me to the front of the class to read them with everyone. Um, and so my love of literature really blossomed through high school. Um, I was also playing a lot of music at the time, so writing songs and things and kind of um, planning to be the next uh, Jimi Hendrix. But <laughs> sometime in college, I realized that probably wasn't going to happen. And at the same time, I was studying literature more, um, more seriously, let's say. And by the time I finished undergrad, I, I knew that I, you know, writing was really all I'd ever wanted to do in a sense, besides the music. Um, and so I got an MFA studying uh, creative writing poetry, and then uh, eventually went on to get a PhD in American literature. And um, all along the way, just always writing, it's just been a really kind of central part of my life and a way that I um, process moving through the world. So I've been lucky enough to 
you know, have some encouragement. Certainly the Poet Laureate ship has been an amazing encouragement. And um, I've had really good luck with publishers and um, people who have helped me out along the way. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And Marianne, same question to you. Yes, well, I started writing as soon as I could write, just like Stephen is saying, like diaries and short stories. Um, and maybe I should have gotten the message when I was about 13 years old, I got a zero, which is the worst mark you can get in school <laughs> from my uh, Dutch teacher, because she, um, I, I handed over a poem, but she didn't believe that it was mine. So she thought I just copied it from internet, or I don't know, there was no internet yet, but she thought I found it somewhere in the library, I think. So that was actually, I was very angry, but that was actually a compliment, I think, now. Um, but it took till like eight years ago. Um, th then I started sharing a bit and then people were enthusiastic, so I started sharing more. But it took me a while before I started really sharing. Yeah, sometimes uh, our teachers, um, you know, give us encouragement and sometimes they say things that, that don't encourage us or make us wanna, uh, want to prove them wrong. <laughs> so. Um, so, Marianne, I'm going to ask you, since you just answered, to do your readings. You're, you have one poem in Dutch, um, and we'll show it in English, and then you have another English poem that you wrote just for this. So, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The first one, I start with the Dutch one, and it's called Pilgrims. De geruststellende gedachte dat vandaag alles nog mogelijk is. Belgiumstochten, thuisblijven, studies, verhuizen. Dat er voorlopig nog zeeën zijn. Een smeltend ijs. Beekjes, vlaktes, breuklijnen. Dat er nog dagen, jaren, maanden. En nog veel langer voor groots en mislepend zijn. Voor gepassioneerd, betekenisvol en ongeïnteresseerd bang houden. Dat de tijd van niemand is. En dus van iedereen. Dat het is als regen. Zonder buienrader. Die je vertelt wanneer het begint. En eindigt. And now the one I wrote especially for this occasion. It's called No New Land. How does one live? In old footsteps. Even if the heart talks about a new beginning and perhaps even new land. Can we take turns standing on each other's shoulders, accepting the changing view and the spirit of the elders? How does pure belief settle whilst making room for the old? Can we welcome in fine fettle beliefs we do not believe in and find balance in conviction between peaceful and bold when saints and strangers sail over separate seas, calling the place they blend into home, then more than just people come ashore. When you, Rome, calling this new land, can I say, liar, there always was this ground, making your destiny a trick, a story, a desire. Did you not know of the one-way road around which true arrival is twining? Could not implore your tongue to be silent. Listen to the story of the land. While my eyes withdraw from the backlight shining of history behind the new dawn. That it was beautiful. Thank you so much. And it actually um, helps me to, to, you know, with this next question. So this is going to go to all three of you, of course. Um, we have a shared history in the story of the pilgrims, the English colonists who traveled to, uh, from England to Holland and ultimately to New England. In 2020, we looked at the 1620 history of the pilgrims and the indigenous Wampanoag in a way that balances the history, adds back in what historians left out and examines the different perspectives of these two disparate cultures. In what ways, if any, have historic themes of any era influenced your work? And I'm going to start with Marianne. 
Um, yes, they have. Um, especially as a poet laureate, I, I get asked to write about certain occasions. For example, we have a big uh, celebration in Leiden. Uh, on the 3rd of October, we celebrate um, uh, liberation after a Spanish siege, which is really huge in Leiden. So I really went into the history of that before writing poems about that. Um, and there are poems I wrote about the war and, and, and other things that really um, yeah, demanded to look back in history. So yeah, I do a lot. Excellent, thank you. Um, and Laura, can you answer the same question? And actually your reading was a perfect example. Yeah, that was the first piece I've written actually with a historic theme. Um, so everything else up until now has been quite contemporary, but I think being the, the Plymouth Laureate of Words is sort of, it's allowing me to kind of delve into the history of Plymouth, which is very rich. So I've been working with the local museum and going into their archives. Um, I'm also just about to start writing a piece about my own family history. So my my mom and my nan's family, my mom's family, are all from South Wales, from a place called Tredegar, which is where Aniron Bevan was born, and he founded the British National Health Service. And she has a beautiful story of going to listen to him practice his speeches on the hillside. So I'm using that as inspiration for my next piece, and and certainly a lot of the history of Plymouth I'll be. I'll be bringing forward into my work. Excellent, thank you so much. And then Stephen, I'm gonna ask you to answer that question and then you're gonna do your reading. So I'm gonna let you segue right into that reading. Perfect, yes. I mean, growing up in downtown Plymouth, it's such a historical place, uh, a rich destination, you know, of many different uh, journeys over the years, of course, from the pilgrims that we all learn about in, uh, in elementary school, but, you know, it's always been an, a kind of uh, eclectic and culturally diverse community. And that has always fascinated me, the many stories of the town, of the people who have grown up here and, you know, lived here at different times. And, um, Becoming the poet laureate of Plymouth really encouraged my fascination with history, especially local history. Um, and so I've really been doing a lot more research in a shorter period of time than I probably would have otherwise. Um, connected with several commissioned poems I've written over the past year. Um, also uh, an anthology project of Plymouth poetry that I'm putting together. So I've been doing quite a bit of research uh, in the Bartlett Room at the Plymouth Public Library and, you know, just trying to find as many interesting historical stories and tidbits and characters as I can. Um, from the Sea Serpent of Plymouth Bay that's mentioned in uh, Thoreau's journals to characters like Branch Pierce, who was a famous local hunting guide. Um, you know, there's just, there's so many known stories and so many unknown stories and the more reading and research I've done about Plymouth history, uh, the, the more I've found. And it's really um, a, a great source of inspiration and subject matter for poetry um, and really an inexhaustible source for, uh, for that. And it really, you know, doing research on, on your hometown, the place where you live, it really gives you a different uh, point of view on the place and modifies your relationship with your surroundings. And I think that's uh, incredibly valuable. And um, the poem that I'd like to read is called Poem for Plymouth Cordage. And this is the first poem that I wrote for the laureateship. And uh, it's written with the 400th an anniversary in mind um, in 2020. And what I was really trying to do in this poem is uh, kind of combine all the stories of Plymouth that I, my own story, my own relationship with Plymouth, uh, the stories of, you know, my friends and family in Plymouth, people that I've met, and stories that I've found in my research. And as I said, it's such a rich uh, topic, it's almost, you know, too much for any single poem. And so it was a real challenge to try to write something that would kind of, you know, encapsulate this 400 year history, look back and look forward at the same time, but also be kind of rooted in the present and take in uh, the present Plymouth into account as well. And um, in, in many of my poems, I'm trying to take big topics and, and express them through singular or simple means. And so I was looking for a metaphor for all of these stories. And I settled on uh, Plymouth Cordage. As you know, I'm sure many Plymouthians would know Cordage Park 
being, you know, the economic and in some ways cultural center of the town for, for more than a century, uh, well into the mid 20th century. Mm -hmm. And um, also just the idea that there used to be these boats coming from around the world with raw materials sailing into Plymouth and those raw materials would be made into, uh, into this rope that was then shipped around the world and used on ships around the world. I just found that so fascinating and kind of, you know, too rich to ignore as a yeah. subject for poetry. And what's more is that um, Plymouth Cordage was really famous around the world as being excellent quality rope. And they had a particular type of rope which had a lubricated heart. Uh, the core, the center of the rope was lubricated and it made the rope particularly flexible um, and strong and durable. And so all of these things coming together, all the stories, you know, travelers coming into Plymouth uh, with raw materials and creating something that, that's then shipped around the world, um, it all kind of came together, I hope. Um, you know, I hope it came together well, at least in this poem. So this is poem for Plymouth Cordage. Thank you. Help weave this heart rope, this cordage of wordage, woven memories, imagination, image, and nation, individuals' dreams. 400 years we weave a rope across horizon, gathering every moment we find and write and tell the stories. We take the rope in dinghies and set off toward Europe. Others stay in Plymouth, weaving the rope we carry back eastward around the world. The words, the wars, the bombs, the tragedies and joys, the people, the syllable lifelines. A story, shivering pilgrims, all aboard over a month, 13 years from home, desperation, their daily ration, then Cape Cod cupped hand. When white men first came ashore and Wampanoag braves watched from shadowy pine patches, there was a mirror between them. Each saw the limits of their imagination reflected in the other. Protestants in the people of dawn, a mirror between them no attack could shatter. That summer fog swallowed the fireworks. That winter they dredged and dredged the harbor depths. We sledded Burial Hill. That spring was Ziggy's strawberry dipped. We shape and are shaped by our location. Massachusetts, a Wampanoag word, meaning place of the foothill. Plymouth from Plymouth, England, meaning mouth of the river plum. I was born on a coast's crooked shoulder where gauze white waves sling shore and sand dunes frame dreams, where fishermen with missing thumbs used to huddle in fragrant fog from coffee mugs and briar pipes. Just now I am lying down to find sleep, reading the braille of stars over Plymouth. And these words are stories, strands in the cordage we are, weaving we, learn everything we can and share it. We are gathering and carrying this rope around the world. We set out back eastwards from Plymouth MA to UK and Leiden, zigzag across all continents, collecting stories and sending them back to be woven, to keep us together and everyone helps as we carry the rope under the Golden Gate, over the Rockies, across Ohio, and here we are at Old Exit 6, coming back into town to tie the knot. Thank you, Stephen. Those of us who live here certainly um, recognize a lot of that imagery, so thank you. Um, okay, so we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to throw a lightning round question at the three of you. Um, it, 2020 has been a year that no one expected and that disrupted our whole world. The pandemic has had devastating effects, but it looks like we're headed toward a safer and changed world ahead. In our final two minutes uh, together as wordsmiths, can you give us three descriptive words that you would use in a piece about our future after the pandemic? And so I will start with Stephen. Well, three words. Uh, help, hope, and humanity. Excellent. Thank you. And Marianne? Hark, change, belly button. 
<laughs> Very good. You mean as in contemplating? <laughs> and then Laura. Hope, justice, and empathy. Excellent. Well, I wish, you know, we had so much more time to talk to you all. I could talk to you for another half hour at least. But thank you all for being with us from all different parts of our world. We're really, really pleased to have had you. So uh, thank you, Marianne, Laura, and Stephen for joining me for this episode of Plymouth 400 Conversations. Thank you for joining thank us you so much. for Plymouth 400 Conversations. Special thanks to our sponsors and guests who have made this series possible. And special thanks to our partners, PAC TV and the Center for Active Living in Plymouth. For more information about this or how to view past episodes, please visit our website, Plymouth400inc.org. Until next time, go make some history.